Let me begin by introducing Professor Dan Bahat to you. He is an Israeli archaeologist who is especially known for his excavations in Jerusalem. Uh, Dan was born in Poland uh, to parents uh, there who were a part of the early Zionist group Mandatory Palestine, and the family actually moved to Tel Aviv in 1939 uh, before the uh, uh, atrocities of World War II began. He, began an, he became an Israeli citizen uh, in 1948, one of the earliest of, of the Israeli citizens. He served in the uh, uh, Israel Defense uh, Organization military from 1956 to 1958. And in 1964, he earned his bachelor's degree in archaeology and Jewish history from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Becoming there a close friend with uh, Ehud Netzer, excavating at Masada, and also working with uh, Yegel Yadin on that important excavation. He finished his master's degree in 1978, and in 1990, he obtained the PhD degree from uh, the Hebrew University, his topic was topography and top toponymy from Crusader Jerusalem. Uh, he has served as the district archaeologist of Jerusalem uh, from 1978 to 1990, and before that he had served as the district archaeologist for Galilee. Uh, he's worked on digs at Tel Dan up in the northern Galilee, uh, at Bet Sheon in uh, uh, there at the east end of the Jezreel Valley, near the uh, Jordan Valley, uh, working there on the synagogue. He uh, has also excavated on uh, the site of Herod's magnificent palace in Jerusalem. In 1989, he became the only the third person to receive the Jerusalem Archaeology Award. And he's now an associate professor of theology at the University of St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto. Uh, Dan, we welcome you to Provo and look forward to your uh, introduction and then lecture on the archaeology of the temples. Shalom, as we say in Hebrew. Uh, now, uh, there are a few things I wanted to say before. First of all, I brought some slides, some of the pictures. Just to speak, we speak about the temple, I want to see what we know of the temple, what we have of the temple, and then I'll have the real lecture. But before I start, I want to go back also to some things. First of all, the sanctity of Jerusalem, or the sanctity of the Temple Mount, stems from Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, that's where the sanctity starts. The word Moriah is very interesting. It comes from the Hebrew root. It comes from the Hebrew root. Uh, you know that Hebrew has got every word have got a root of three letters. Yes, in Hebrew we don't have consonant and vowels, oral consonant. And uh, that's why we need the dots. Yes, when you write. Now, the thing is that Moriah comes from the verb to found, to found. The summit of Mount Moriah is a stone of foundation which is sheltered today by the Dome of the Rock. The rock is actually the stone of foundation. The root from which the name Moriah comes is also the root from which the name Jerusalem comes. Jerusalem is, in Hebrew, Yeru Shalem. Yeru, Moriah, is the same root. Yeru Shalem means the city founded by God Salem. God Salem was one of the Canaanite gods, you see? Salem is the god of night. There is a god of day and there is a god of night. He was the god of night, Salem, Jerusalem, founded by the god Salem. That's the name of Jerusalem. It is very interesting because in the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, to begin with, always it is Jerusalem, hence Jerusalem. But when King Hezekiah added to Jerusalem another quarter and Jerusalem became a double city, the name in the latest prophets is called Yerushalayim 
because ayim in Hebrew is double. Yadaim, raglaim, enaim, oznaim, always double. So then actually when we speak about Jerusalem, as it is called in Hebrew, it is already when it is a double city. The other thing which I want to say before I go on is the following thing. Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is a basic thing to Jerusalem, very basic. When we have the story in Genesis about the uh, bondage of Isaac, and again it is in one of the mountains in the land of Moriah, as the Bible says, and the Bible describes the whole story, the salvation of Isaac and so on, and at the end the Bible says God will be seen. Moriah, God will be seen. But everybody who knows Hebrew knows that to be seen or to see and Moriah are completely different roots. It must have been that it was an intrusion by the person who put the Old Testament on paper or whatever, and God will be seen wants to say something like, God will be seen in the three annual pilgrimages, which are basic thing in Judaism. On which actually we've got, this is our topic now. Now, the story begins actually with the Temple Mount. You can see very well the square mountain, which was built by Herod the Great. It was, he, when Herod the Great came to Jerusalem and he decided to build a Temple Mount in this enormous size, and you should know that the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is the largest religious monument in the classical world. There is not even one. The Western Wall, which you see here, you see the Western Wall is almost half a kilometer, almost half a kilometer. There is no it is five, uh, 488 meters. I speak in meters, but uh, you know, you can always do it in feet, you multiply by three. <laughs> At any rate, uh, and you see here the Dome of the Rock, and the Dome of the Rock is sheltering the Holy Rock, which is the site of the Holy of Holies. And you see that it is not in the center of the mountain, it is cleaning, it is in inclining, oh, that's a problem. I love the old, the old slides. You see? It is actually to the west of the central line of the, the central line of the, of the central axis of the Temple Mount. And therefore also the Muslim who are sensitive to it, you see, built this little dome here to mark the center of the Temple Mount. It is very important. Why is it like that? Because of the shape of Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah occupies an area here, and from the Mishnah we know that on the Temple Mount, the, the Holy Temple was standing in the northwestern quarter of the mountain. That is what uh, it was there. Now, when we go further, we can see here the Dome of the Rock, which is, as I said, it is a Byzantine building. Whoever wants to know how the Constantinian Church or the Constantinian um, uh, the uh, 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 rotunda, the anastasis of the church was, you can see this, it is larger, it is bigger, because it was also a kind of a manifestation of, a uh, manifestation of Islam. It, it, uh, it speaks, there are, I don't know if you know, there are six times repeating, uh, repeating an inscription saying, uh, don't mention the name of Jesus as the Son of God. God did not have children. God never begotten the children. No one, uh, you don't say, better don't say the word Holy Trinity. Very interesting. So as I say, it is a manifestation and that's how we should accept it. Since the shape is a, you know, the octagon and so on is typical to Byzantine contemporary churches, we know where we are. This is the Temple Mount as it goes today. You can see again, I brought it in only to show you the Temple Mount is not exactly a rectangular because you see that the western wall, the western wall is inclining slow, slightly out. You see the straight line should have been something like that. It is simply because of the dry, deep river bed which runs along the wall here and that is why it is like that. You can see that's the Temple Mount today. I would like only to specially mention the Golden Gate which is here which has got nothing to do with the old traditions of Judaism about the Temple Mount and its, uh, and its, uh, and its gates and so on, but that's a lecture, a separate lecture. Already in antiquity, already in, not in antiquity, but already in the 17th, 19th century, people started to look at the temple. Everyone did another re uh, reconstruction of the Temple Mount. Here you can see one, which is very interesting. 
And uh, I want to say, you see, it is really square. It is not, it is not a, a rectangular as we know it. Why is it square? Because in the Mishnah, when the Temple Mount described, they said that it is 500 cubits on 500 cubits, meaning real square. I'll talk about it later because this is a basic thing to understand the New Testament. Without understanding that Herod the Great built a Temple Mount, which we see today, this is actually a temple on which Jesus was, but in order to understand the various parts of it, you have to understand that when Herod came to the Temple Mount, it was a previous Temple Mount which was completely square, and I'll refer to it in a minute. Now, just a few examples to show. This is one of the one which I accept more than others, but there are also other suggestions of the plan of the Temple of Solomon. You can see in front the two columns, Yakin and Boaz, then the steps. The important thing is the division of the Temple Mount here to three parts. You've got the portico, the hall, and the Holy of Holies. I'm not so sure that this is the way as it was, but at least we can understand that more or less how the Temple of Solomon was. This is thanks to the description which we have in the Book of Kings. Another reconstruction is this one. You see the two columns are not separated, and you go inside. All the, all the rooms around which form the lower part are very important because remember that the temple, besides other things, had a function which is very important in Judaism to find the, the, the birth of the moon in the beginning of every month because that's the only way by which they could make a calendar. I'm always surprised to this very day when I speak to my Muslim friends, I ask them, when is your holiday starting? Two days before, they say, we don't know yet because they have to wait till the, the, the sheikhs or whoever will say, I've seen the moon, beginning of the month. You see, so the Jews had the same thing. Look at those two columns, the two bronze columns, which you see in the front. Another possibility of the reconstruction is this one. I found it, I will be surprised, only a few days ago, I found this model in Memphis, in one of the churches in Memphis, beautiful reconstruction of the temple of the tabernacle and the temple of Herod. Here they put another, uh, another theory where the two columns were supporting the main entrance to the structure and inside they show all the other parts of the structure. You see, this is the front of it, where you have got the sea, the bronze sea, the copper sea, the altar on the side, the slaughterhouse, and all the other parts, and it is really a beautiful, beautiful reconstruction. Another reconstruction of the temple is this one. They are all non-scientific, but they always base themselves on the description of Josephus Flavius and all the Mishnah. Our theory is that today we understand that both, both descriptions, which are the basis to the understanding of the temple, come from Mishnah, which describes one temple, and Josephus Flavius, which describes another temple. Which temple is described by the Mishnah? It is the temple which we know the construction of which in the beginning of the Hellenistic period, which is described in precision in two important books of the Hellenistic literature, one of them is the letter of Aristias, around the beginning of the 3rd century BC, and the other one, the book of Sirach, which is about 100 years later. And today, when we understand the separation, one of the things which help us is, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls, because we have got here, you can see a, represent, a representation of the temple and its precinct, as is described in the, in, in the temple scroll, but the important thing is that when you take this one and you read Ezekiel, you'll find out that there is a very, very similar description. In other words, I can say that for hundreds of years, from the 5th century, the time of Ezekiel, to the year 70, there was a kind of an undercurrent of a description of the temple which was different from the actual temple. You can see here the last the large court, and here you see there is a very interesting thing which you have to really to be careful about and Josephus Flavius, when he speaks about the Temple Mount, he uses three different words, Agion, Hieron, and Naos. And you have always to think, what does it refer in each? He also, when he describes the Temple Mount, he speaks about an outer court and an inner court. Here you can see you've got the outer court, and when you get in details, you can see the inner court around the temple itself. 
which is very, very important to know that indeed the concept of outer and inner quarter, uh, 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 inner uh, courts is very, very important. I will say, and now I come to my story, I will say another thing. What you can see here is the Temple Mount. You can see the precinct is very similar to the Herodian one, but I've marked something which says the limits of the pre-Herodian Temple Mount. Can you see it? A kind of a smaller square where the temple is inside. This is actually, those, this square is the square of the Mishnaic Temple Mount, which is earlier than the Herodian. When Herod the Great ascended the throne and became and built the temple, he extended the Temple Mount in the south, west, and north. The east, you see that the temple reaches all the way, all the way to the eastern portico of the Temple Mount. Not surprising, therefore, that when Josephus Flavius speaks about it, he said that it was already built by Solomon. He didn't know about the a Hellenistic Temple Mount, which I've mentioned. And remember that it is very important. It was attributed to Solomon. And if you remember, Jesus, in the holiday of Hanukkah, of the consecration of the temple, was walking under Solomon's portico, which means he went out of the, out of the temple and right he found himself in this ancient portico, which is there. Why is it to me so important? And now I'll say something. Again, a bit of politics, I cannot refrain, because that's what, when you live in Jerusalem and you deal with the temple today, it somehow, whenever you do, it goes in. You know that when many pilgrims, especially Catholic pilgrims, uh, Greek Orthodox pilgrims, they come and they do the Via Dolorosa, which means there is a kind of, I will say, a kind of canonized holy places. And you walk from the first station to all the station, all the way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I say sepulchre, you say sepulchre, because you, we even write it differently, as you know. At any rate, with the E at the beginning, at the end, or the E before the end, you know, before the R. At any case, the interesting thing is, even they who are addicted so much to holy places, when they go to the Temple Mount, they go to see the beauty of the Islamic art of the Dome of the Rock and Aqsa Mosque, not thinking even that actually, when you think of it, Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem, all his activities are on the Temple Mount. Only the Pool of Siloam and the Pool of Bethesda, where he healed here the blind and here the paralytic, otherwise he's not mentioned anywhere else in Jerusalem, only in the Temple Mount. So you can ask, so why isn't the Temple Mount a part of the, how shall I say, the curriculum of the, of a pilgrim? Because of simple reason. When the holy places were created as holy places, which are followed to this very day, Christians were not allowed to go to the Temple Mount. Already when Saladin conquered Jerusalem from the Crusaders, who actually invented the concept of Via Dolorosa on the Temple Mount, from the Golden Gate to a gate which was called the Gate Le Port Toloreuse in French, which means the word Dolorosa is there, straight to the Temple Mount. That's why the Golden Gate is on the line, on the axis of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and not where the Herodian Gate was. But when Saladin conquered Jerusalem from the Crusaders, he said, Christians and Jews are not allowed on the Temple Mount. And that was it. And therefore, when the Via Dolorosa and all the holy places of today were created in Jerusalem, there was no access to the Temple Mount, and thus it will remain outside. Very simple. What we should think about it, that when we go today to the Temple Mount, we should think about it, that this is also holy places. I am terribly interested in the problem of Jesus on the Temple Mount, and I think that today, thanks to the fact that we know about the previous Temple Mount and the later Temple Mount, namely the one, the small square, and then the Herodian rectangular, we know that the inner part, namely the old Temple Mount, is called by Josephus Flavius, is called the inner court, whereas the Herodian extension is the external court. You remember the story in the outer court. You remember in, in the book of Acts, the story of Paul who comes with two Greeks. You remember, no, gentle Greeks. What do the Jews tell him? Go to the place which is allotted to them, right? 
There were with fury. The point is that the Herodian addition to the Temple Mount was not considered as holy as the 500 cubits, the smallest square. Why? Because the smallest square today, thanks to excavations in the 19th century by a British archaeologist, Sir Charles Warren, we know exactly the size of Mount Moriah. And if you take Mount Moriah, we engulf it by a square, it will be about 750, 750 feet, which means more or less the 500 cubits on 500 cubits. And therefore, if the Gentiles got the Herodian extension to beat them, and therefore I'm able to say, if you ask me what is the Gentiles got, which is, by the way, is not mentioned at all in Jewish sources, I can tell you the Herodian extension to the pre-Herodian Temple Mount. You understand? It's simply, suddenly it becomes clear. Not only that, I can explain tell you where, where, just I mentioned, Solomon's portico where he walked. I can tell you where, when he was 12 years old, where did he discuss the law with the rabbis. You know, everything is, is become, I'll tell you more than that. If you ask me where the, the money changes are, I can tell you also where they were. There is only one place that they, they can be. But I'll leave it for next time. At any rate, you see, it is very interesting. No, because everything like this takes long time. <laughs> At any rate, you see there are many reconstructions of the temple. You can see more or less the same. I will tell you, this is in the Israel Museum today. It is the famous model which once was in the Holy Land. Beautiful, beautiful model which was done by my professor who, taught, who started to tell me in Jerusalem. And it, he made it before 67, which means when we were, we were not able to go to the old city of Jerusalem. It is beautiful. It is divided into three courts. Uh, I won't show it here, I'll show it in the next slide. You see, this is the typical reconstruction of the Temple Mount. And here you can see as follows, the Eastern Gate, which, what happened in the Eastern Gate? John and Paul healed the mendicant. You remember that. This is the women's court, very big. The women's court was not considered, uh, as I will say, in the calculation of making the topography of Jerusalem, Women's court is not considered a part of the temple, although it is a very vivid part, the most, most active, I will say, part of the temple. It has got four chambers. It is called the women's court because it was the closer to which women could come. Uh, the women did not walk here. They had, they were terra they had terraces on top of it, and that's where they walked. Men walked down, women on the terraces above. The famous Nicanor Gate, very important in my story later when I'll speak about the holidays. You see, this is where the priests were standing, blessing the people who was here. And we, we you see, I'm telling you. It's, uh, yes, that's it. You can see here, women were standing on top, men down, and you can see how the priests were standing and blessing here. What you cannot see here, here is a little doll, and here is a little doll where all the musical instruments of the temple were held. And from here you go inside to the temple itself, the altar with a big embankment which brought all the way to the altar on top. This is the slaughterhouse where the animals, see, I don't know why it does it, where the animals of sacrifice were flight, you know, the skin was taken off and everything. And then you go to this, this is the sanctuary where you go inside, again, divided to portico, the whole and the Holy of Holies. Again, also here, a series of stairwells and things to grow up and to be able to watch, a way to watch the, the birth of the moon. Very important. The moment the priest on, in Jerusalem saw the moon coming out, they lit a big fire, and this fire went all the way to Babylon to declare the month is starting. On top also were the spikes mentioned, you know, to prevent the birds from sitting on the side and, and making dirt on the walls. One of the things which are make a part of the holiday, of the preparation for the Passover was the temple was whitewashed. The temple was, was whitewashed. It was always very white. And they say that it was as white as the snows of the mountains of Lebanon. Very, very much so. This habit of whitewashing before Passover is still diffused. I remember a few years ago, I've been to Tunisia 
in the famous island of Jerba, where there is a Jewish community of priests living to this very day. And they came, everybody was busy whitewashing the, uh, the houses and everything. They did not know that actually it comes from the temple. This is an attempt to reconstruct the temple, which I built. It was made by my dear friend, Professor Eod Netzer, who was mentioned before. And uh, you see here, you see again the temple, the sanctuary, but he tried his way as an architect, he tried to show that the women's court is a bit smaller and as if it's separated from the whole structure. Again, you can see here the square which makes the pre-Herodian Temple Mount. I'll tell you that this is becoming more and more uh, accepted by all the scholarly community that Herod added from three sides, as you can see here. You see from three sides was added to the Herodian, the Herodian edition is all that. And why isn't it so holy? Because it is beyond Mount Moriah. The deep ravine crosses here, goes under the Temple Mount. Here is a deep ravine which was filled in by Herod the Great. Here was a corner of a mountain cut by Herod the Great, which means it changed completely uh, the Temple Mount. You can see again the beautiful model of the Temple Mount. I bring it again only to give you the idea. Now, the interesting thing is that the temple itself, the sanctuary, as you can see, was very, very high. It is mentioned as being a hundred, a hundred cubits high, which makes it about, I would say, 150 feet high. Very, very, very high, protruding over. Here you can see, and I brought it here in order to show you the terraces, the terraces around it and so on. The last thing which I want to show is the southern wall. It's actually not the south, it's almost the south. And you see the su southern wall, and this is the place where, to my opinion, was the site where Jesus, 12 years old, teaching the rabbis, or discussing the rabbi. Why is that? Because with those steps, which are, they were unfortunately, the continuation was destroyed by a Muslim building, but they go all the way down to here, because here is another gate to the temple. The interesting thing, enormous stairwell. It was this stairwell par excellence in Jerusalem. And the interesting thing is that the Mishnah tells us that out of three courts which were in Jerusalem, courthouses, one was on the steps. Rabban Gamliel, who was the chief rabbi, so to use a modern term, in the days of Jesus, was standing on the steps t talking to the people. And the last and not the least, an inscription from Herod's time in which one word can be read, which says the Kenim, the older ones, the old ones. In ancient Hebrew, the Kenim can be sages, clever people, and old people and intelligent people. That's always. I try to convince my children, the older I get, more clever I am, they think the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> at, any rate, <laughs> at any rate, that's how it is. If it says to the old elders, it means the place was uh, allotted only to the elders to stand and speak. That was actually the idea, and therefore I think it was here. Because remember, it must have been not inside. Again, the problem is when they speak the temple, the question is the temple or the temple mount? Not so easy to see. You have always to think, you have to always to think, I want one day to take all the names of Josephus Flavius to the sanctuary and to ask which one is referring clearly in the light of what I said, or an outer court or inner court, to say that actually... Uh, what does Josephus refers to? On the next slide, you can see one of the passages to the temple, and you can see that actually it, is, uh, it was a very serious structure altogether. And here we go to the other thing. Here we go to the other thing. You see, this is from a book, a, a book written in Germany in the medieval era, and you see all the implements of the temple, like the altar which you see here, the candelabrum which you see here, all the, all the trumpets, all the jars, everything, you see these are the two trumpets. All of them are represented, as you know, in the, uh, in the uh, you know, the, uh, some, some things in the archaeology and sometimes in the Ark of Titus. And this is really uh, almost the last one. This is Sheik's uh, look. People admire the way by which the Temple Mount looked. And as Professor Charles Wall mentioned, the fire coming out from the sacrifice where adds a kind of spirituality, I'll say, of going up to the, the Temple Mount. It was such a beautiful thing that a, a French nobleman, Marquis de Verguer, he made in 1968, he made uh, another reconstruction of the temple. 
principles is beautiful, but to show you that this is really a very, very imposing structure which everybody admired, everybody admired as it was uh, in Jerusalem. And sometimes it gives it really not only the dimension of a building and a beautiful building, but it adds also by pulling everything up and up to give it also the dimension of uh, spirituality. And I think that this is very important. Now, this is what I wanted to show you about the temple to explain the problem of, the problem of, um, no, this is the last one, you see, the problem of um, the, the various courts, the location of holy places. You know, when I walk in Jerusalem, if you can put the windows back, it would be nicer. At any rate, I want to show you when I walk on the Temple Mount, you know, being Jewish, I still think of Jesus because Jesus represents for me he represents for me really a Jew from the Galilee, a simple person who comes to Jerusalem and he sees the glory of the Temple Mount. Today we know that Nazareth, his place, was a tiny place. I don't know if you know that only in the last few years was discovered for the first time private houses in Nazareth. Tiny place, tiny place. Fortunately enough, it was discovered in, uh, it was discovered adjacent to the Church of the Annunciation, which means it is really, it gives us a real picture of another. Imagine a person is going there, it takes him a few days to walk all the way to Jerusalem, coming to Jerusalem through Jericho, the events in Jericho, and he comes and he sees this fantastic structure there, which is with no equal in the classical world. That's the way I see Jesus on the Temple Mount. You see? Because in Judaism, I mean, in the Jewish writings, and we never think about it, but in the Jewish writings, we don't have a story of a simple person going to the Temple Mount. We always read the laws, we read everything. But in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when you read about Jesus, it is the first time that you see somebody doing something on the Temple Mount. A simple person, not a priest, not nothing. A simple person. What is he doing on the Temple Mount? Now, I, now the part which I read. It's, not, it's less exciting. <laughs> At any rate, the temple administration was conducted by 24 priestly families. Sometimes the, the time which they used on the Temple Mount is called courses. And uh, they, they, I will tell you in, in simple, there were 24 priestly families. Every such family came to Jerusalem for two weeks to serve in two weeks. And why you can know, you know, if it is two weeks and 24 families, it will be only 48 weeks. But we know that there are 52 weeks in the year. So why, what happens with the four? They start again. The point is that they knew that if they will make 52, which means 26 families, the same family always will be on the high holiday. The same family will be always on the Passover. The same family will be. So therefore, they decided to make it in such a way that in many years, in a, uh, in a priest's lifetime, he will serve in all the holidays uh, of the year. And so actually, they managed to do it uh, like this. The function was a kind of a police on the Temple Mount, very important, a kind of a police on the temple, holy place, to guard its gate and also to prevent those for reasons of impurity could not enter the various section of the temple and its courts. You had to be pure. The priestly families were the symbol of eternity of the temple. And after the temple was destroyed and the family left Jerusalem, many went to the Galilee and the synagogues were tablets mentioning the families, few of which were found. And the most exciting one, that the only one which was intact, which was still installed in a synagogue, you won't believe where it was found. Which is the country you hear more than anything in the news today? Yemen. In Yemen was found in a synagogue from very old days, very difficult to say, was found a whole tablet of the family and the families and the villages in the Galilee where they live. All the villages in the Galilee where they live, some of them are ruins and some of them are Arab villages of the Galilee today. They retain the name to this very day, Iblin, Sakhnin, and and so on, to this very day. And the people think it is Arabic names. No, it is already mentioned in the Mishnah. It was a Jewish town. At any rate, 
uh, uh, when the end of those families came in the 11th century, the nation lamented them and lamented odds were preserved to the present. You see, they were odes. They wrote songs about the priestly family. We know it very well from the most important document of Jewish life in antiquity. I don't know if you heard of it. The cachement of, of documents which were found in a synagogue in Cairo which is today in Cambridge in England, where you have really piles and piles and piles of testimonies about the priestly families which were there. Uh, at the head of the administration was the high priest. His position was meant to be for life, and the Mishnah doesn't specify which family he was. The position was obtained by deliberations amongst the heads of the people, possibly the Sanhedrin, and not always it was clear uh, how he was elected. In many of those cases, it was heredity from father to son. The high priest plays the most famous respected role in life of the temple, where on the Day of Atonement he could enter the Holy of Holies. The visit of the high priest to the Holy of Holies was full of tension, and people were worried about him going into the place, of, into the place full of divine glory on that day. Stories were diffused amongst visits which he could do. For example, there was a story which was very much around that according to the story, when he went into the temple, when he got inside and behind the veils where you could not see, um, you could not see really what is going on there, the story was that a man with white hair, with very big white beard, accompanied when he went in and always also when he went out. One year, when the, this man accompanied the high priest going in, he didn't accompany him when he went out. So everybody knew, and he told about it, that he did not accompany. So the priest himself, the high priest himself, and the people knew that he was going uh, to die. Uh, he's going uh, to die in that day. Now, the contamination of the Temple Mount was the worst scene, as was visible by everyone. And uh, you know that according to the Mishnah, according to the Mishnah, when somebody who was impure, it referred mostly to the Gentiles. Gentiles usually, not because they were bad people, but they were not circumcised. And the non-circumcised people were considered to be impure, or women who didn't know the laws of the purity after the monthly uh, period. And therefore, they could not go into the temple. There was a priest, uh, there was a kind of a wall on which stones, which were mentioned by Professor Charlesworth, mentioning forbidding the Gentile from trespassing under the penalty of death. Unfortunately, we found only the two stones which we found. One is in Istanbul, the other one in Jerusalem. They are in Greek. We don't have the Latin version yet, although Josephus Flavius tells us about it. I hope that one day it will be found. Altogether, I want to tell you my feeling is that the greatest discoveries in Jerusalem are still ahead of us. Only this year was discovered something very interesting and very important, which we did not believe. You know that according to the story, the high priest had on his dress, on the garments which he wore, little bells, in order that everybody, when he comes and the bells chime, they will know the high priest is coming. One of those bells were found this year in excavations, which is amazing. We see the size, we know exactly. It is amazing how suddenly Everything which has got physical meaning is be being found. It is being found, and it is really beautiful because we know that this is how things were. The daily temple chores of the temple started in the morning where some of the priests cleansed the altar. It had to be cleaned all the time from the ashes and everything. Removing remains of the previous day's sacrifices, also filling the water, in, uh, water the lavers which were the priests caught. And before any activity, the priest had to wash their head. Then, cleansing the altar, incense, and the candlestick, etc. After all the implements mentioned were made in metal, just the altar of the offering was made of fill wall stones, as the Pentateuch says. You understand why? Because uh, this is a place for life, to ensure life. Whereas iron was considered to be a metal which causes death because of swords and all the, all the arms and so on. So therefore, that's how it was. In the early morning, the priest ascended the high side where they could find out when the sun is appearing. On seeing that, the lamp of sacrifice was brought from the chamber 
where he was kept, cleansed, checked as being fit for sacrifice, which means any animal which was not, any animal which was not 100% pure, 100% clean, with no problems like broken legs or missing an ear or whatever, could not be sacrificed. The same thing refers to priests. The problem of the priest was that a priest could serve only young men because the moment he starts to have one white hair or a small scar as a result of an injury or whatever, or being bold, as can happen to some people here amongst us, then you understand he could not serve anymore. In other words, only the young people. So what did the old, when the whole family came, what did the old people do? Imagine, everything had to be pure. I bring wood. A lot of wood was brought to the temple. Now what happens is, in the wood may be a worm, and worm is impure. So there was a special chamber, one of the chambers in the women's court. You remember there were four. The elders of the priests were sitting there, checking every piece of wood which goes to the temple to make sure there is no worm or anything impure in it. You see, very boring job, but still very important uh, for the two weeks they were on the temple mount. They always knew we've got only two weeks, we can manage. At any rate, at any rate, so uh, they had, now, uh, every day you had to have keys to open the sanctuary. The opening of the sanctuary, probably the hinges and everything made great noise. And one of the things to show, for example, the proximity of Jericho to Jerusalem is that the goats of, uh, when they opened the, they opened the gates of the temple, the noise of the hinge was heard in Jericho because Jericho was considered to be the footstep of Jerusalem. And hence, you remember the story of Jesus with Zacchaeus. You remember that story with the uh, thing. Not only that, when they offered the first perfumes in the temple, the libation, the smell of the libation was reached. The goats of Jericho sneezed when they had it. You see, all time, to show you all the time, it is important. I'll tell you why. Because people who came to Jerusalem... When they came from the Galilee, they came to, through the Jordan Valley. It was better to go to the Jordan Valley. No mountains like in Samaria. No meeting of Samaritans. All was pure Jewish area. And so when they come to Jericho, ah, they are relieved. We are at the threshold of Jerusalem. This was really the feeling. Remember that it was so much when the Holy Family left Jerusalem. And that's why I say that Jesus talked to the rabbis outside already. They are already walking, and suddenly, where is little Jesus? And they come back to Jerusalem, you see, to find him there. Why do I say it? Because the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, although it is today 30 kilometers, it is one day's walk, but still it was considered already, here we are. Imagine the, the, the excitement, the meeting of people which they've seen in the previous pilgrimages. It is unbelievable what this uh, place was. And then afterwards, of course, after offer, offering the doors, offering the first offering of the day, and everything was really uh, very, very important. Then they had everybody in the city knew that they are coming, uh, that the temple gates are open. Now, although the pilgrims, vill pilgrims vill visited the temple every day, the highlight of the activity in the temple occurred during the three annual pilgrimages. The three annual pilgrimages. It was the, the, the duty of every Jew to appear in the temple three times a year. It's not the three times they came, but the three times a year, Jews had to come. You know, I've been here in, in the Feast of, of the Booth, or Feast of Tabernacle. I will not come anymore this year. I'll come next year. Oh, I decided in the Feast of the Pentecost, I will come again after half a year. You see, but three times a year was the great pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was so congested with people that the that, uh, uh, Mishnah tells us that when they were standing, it was so congested, but when they piled in prayer, suddenly the place was spacious, so they could do it easily. In Jerusalem, there was a law. The inhabitants of Jerusalem had to let people stay with them at home during the holidays and not to take money for it. I mean, you could come to any house in the city. Usually I can imagine that people already knew each other 
And they knew, the men from the Galilee knew, when I'm coming to Jerusalem, I'm going to the house of Mr. X and Y, because I've been there already many times in the past, and I'll stay with him again. Now, in, uh, it was the duty of the Jews to appear in the temples three times a year, the Feast of Tabernacle, the Passover, and the Pentecost. It meant coming on foot from distances from which only the incapable were exempt. Jerusalem was uh, congested by pilgrims and many of the laws ruled that mentioned the sources describing it. It was the obligation to host the pilgrims in the homes of the inhabitants without payment. And the sources say that people never said the place is too congested for me. You see, Jerusalem, no matter what it was there. Or another saying was that the people, uh, that when people were standing as they were engaged, then bowing, there was enough space for all. All these sayings show that the situation in the city was very, very congested. Josephus Flavius speaks about one million pilgrims in the last Passover before the Great Revolt. But even if he exaggerates, it was definitely a congested city, and it is estimated that the city lived at that time was about 80,000 people, which was a really big city. The Jewish, all the Jewish festivities that were based on the agricultural works of the uh, works. The Feast of Tabernacles marked the end of the uh, fruit season. The Passover, the beginning of harvesting the cereals. And the Pentecost, the beginning of picking of the fruits. By the way, because of that, our celebrations are still, our holidays are still like that, because in spite of the fact that we have got the lunar calendar, we have got the leap year. Every four years, every fourth year has got 13 months. Unlike the Muslims whose holidays, like the Ramadan, once can be in summer, once can be in winter, ours are always dead. Because of the leap year, we stick to the sun, to the solar system, and so we maintain it uh, beautifully. So important, because imagine to celebrate the picking of the fruit in the middle of winter or something like that. Yes. As the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, it created a problem adjusting the calendar to the pilgrims, and, and therefore there was leap year to coordinate the pilgrimage with the agricultural calendar. Here comes the temple where the Sanhedrin, sitting in the chamber of the hewn stones, as it was named in the temple, nominated three and later seven sages to decide when there will be a leap year, and the decision of the beginning of the month was also decided in the temple, when the declaration of the beginning of the month was the appearance of the moon marked the moment of the new month. You know that this was so ardently kept that even the destruction of Jerusalem, whoever was in the Holy Land, I mean, let's say Israel of today, they had it. When Babylon became a center of studies, they took the right, they took the right to declare the beginning of the month and there was a real conflict between the diaspora and the, the country, which is, has the upper hand in this discussion, who will declare the new month? Because the new month was really the greatest right of the Jews after the destruction of the temple. All these activities were in the temple, in which there were arrangements for the priests to climb to the roof of the sanctuary to look for the first appearance of the moon. The declaration of the beginning of the month was right of the temple only. And after its destruction, there were deliberations from where it will be declared. After it was decided that the new, that the new uh, uh, month started, be beacons were kindled on the Mount of Olives and then to the point in the country and then the diaspora and then quotation till the whole world seemed to be in flame, which means so many can lights, beacons were all over. Uh, the message reached within a few hours the whole diaspora as far as Babylon. The most important of the three, here I start my lecture, the most important of all the three festivities was the Passover. The duty, quotation, to see the Lord, end of quotation, in the festivity is mentioned few times in the Pentateuch. It is important also, its importance also stems from the historical reason. Is the redemption from the slavery in Egypt by the hand of the Lord. It should be mentioned that the centrality of the temple in the case of the Passover was shown already in the first temple. And here I want to say something very important. 
our imagination of the temple is as real center of Judaism, the real center of the people. The, the, its centrality is beyond, you know, I don't think that there is any temple in the world like that. Its importance was from the religious point of view, economical point of view, political point of view, social point of view, or economical, most important. You know, it is unbelievable, the centrality of the temple. We cannot imagine how important it was. In the first temple period, where most of the people in Jerusalem lived in the city of David, and whoever knows the city of David, in order to go to the temple, which was on the summit of Mount Moriah, you had to cross all the way through the royal palace. And the royal palace was not a building as it is today, Buckingham Palace of Versailles in France. It was pavilions. This is the very typical, the very typical way in Islam, uh, in Islam in, in, modern, in modern times, like let's say the Alhambra in Granada, and in antiquity, that royal palaces were pavilions. Each one had its function. This was the harm, this was the diplomatic center, this was where the king they resided, and so on. They had to pass through that. So nobody went. Nobody went. And now I continue saying like that. Uh, in the first temple, King Hezekiah was the first king to celebrate Passover in the temple, and the book of Kings says that, quotation, it was never seen before in Judah and Israel. You see, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah was the first one, 8th century, around 700 BC. He was the first one to make the temple a real public place for the celebration of the Passover. It happened again under King Josiah 100 years later. The point is that this is really as it was. The first one to make the temple to be a central part for the people, we hear only in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah in the 5th century BC, when all the celebrations and everything, all the uh, reunions of the nation, everything were in the temple. That's when it got its shape as we see today. Although, the chronicle, uh, although in Chronicles, the King Solomon described the celebrating the three festivities, but it was the king himself and not a national celebration as by Hezekiah. The Paschal Supper and the Paschal Lamb, which formed a part of the habits of the holiday, are forming an important factor that was also adopted in Christianity as being the major factor in the Christian rites. Passover had the combination of nature, the end of the winter, the beginning of spring, the beginning of harvesting the, the cereals, and thus bringing the temple, the first sheaves, and the historical event of the Exodus, all gave the holidays a special strength. Seven weeks after the beginning of Passover, which lasted the whole week, the Feast of the Weeks, the Pentecost, was celebrated in the temple. It was to commemorate Moses descending from Mount Sinai, giving the Ten Commandments. And so on and so forth. I don't want to go on that because I'm afraid that my time is over. And now, the last thing. All the holidays mentioned had many customs of reading, convening, and sacrificing in the temple. It may be shown how the temple served as a place of celebration and conventions for the Jewish people uh, altogether. It was not surprising, therefore, that the period of its existence is named the Second Temple Period. That's how we call it to this very day. On the other hand, its destruction in 70 AD was great shock to the people and its loss of st uh, and its loss, which is still nowadays a day of grief when in which people fast and lament the loss. When there were ho some holidays celebrating in the temple, which were not a part of the holidays mentioned in the Pentateuch, these are the Purim, the holiday of the Esther and the dedication of the temple, Hanukkah, the book of Esther, the Megillah, the scroll, was an ex ex par excellence, was read publicly in the temple and could be read by anybody if necessary at times and so on and so forth. But the point is really the centrality of the temple to this very day. You know that it will be surprising that the Orthodox, the religious, the observant people, because of the sanctity of the Temple Mount, don't dare to go up to the temple lest they may desecrate it. It is such, so deeply rooted, the temple is so deeply rooted in the history of the, the temple itself. Thank you very much.